Hello again, physics friends. Today we're going to talk about Newton's third law and how it relates to momentum, conservation of momentum, and what I like to call the momentum principle. So let's just rehash what Newton's third law says. So in, let's take a simple example where we have two objects, object one and two. It could be a star and a planet, or it could be two um, other objects of your choosing, and they are interacting somehow. And as drawn here, they're interacting through a long-range force as opposed to a contact force. And so we can label those interactions according to the forces F12 and F21. And the notation I'm using here is F12 is the force on 1 by 2, and F21 is the force on object 2 by object 1. And as you can see, those forces point in opposite directions, um, but they are the same length. Okay. So in, in v, indeed, that is the content of Newton's third law. Newton's third law tells us that the vector f12 is equal to minus the vector f21. In other words, same magnitude, opposite direction. What I'd like to do today is talk about how this statement of Newton's third law is related to something you might think of as different or independent, um, in other words, the momentum principle and conservation of momentum. So let's try to illustrate it through a few cases. So for our first case, um, we'll consider the following. Um, two objects like those two listed above or drawn above, and no other force is present. So we just have the blue, those two blue vector forces, F12 and F21, and let's choose our system to be both of the objects, okay? So I'm gonna highlight um, in what, well, I'm gonna draw a circle around the objects of interest and call that my system. And let me move this up here a little bit so I have room to work. So where can we go from this now? Well, let's look at what Newton's second law says for object one. Newton's second law tells us that the change of momentum of object one is brought about by the net force on object one, and the change of momentum of object two is brought around about by the net force on object two. Well, what is this net force? Um, well, as defined here, there's only one force on object one, so the net force on object one is just F12, and likewise, for um, object two. So out of Newton's second law, we can see that the rate of change of object one's momentum is given by F12. And similarly, the rate of change of object two's momentum is brought about by F21. Okay. But we want to look at the momentum of our whole system, not just object one or object two separately. So let's combine um, and talk about the momentum of the full system. So I'm going to write capital P to be my system's momentum, and I'll even label it PSIS. And what do I mean by the total system momentum? Well, I mean the momentum of object one as a vector quantity added to the momentum of object two. And if I want to look at the rate of change of my system momentum, I'm going to find that it's just dp1 dt plus dp2 dt. The derivative is a linear function, so you can distribute it through the two terms and the sum on the right-hand side. Okay. And what do we know um, about these two momenta? Well, I know the first one is equal to f12, and I know the second one by Newton's second law is equal to f21. So at this point, I, I can see that the rate of change of thy system's momentum is equal to the sum of these two forces. But Newton's third law tells me that the sum of those two forces is going to be zero. Why is that? Well, F12 and F21 are equal but opposite, so they're going to sum to zero. Well, this is really interesting. This tells us that the rate of change of the system's momentum is zero. And if that's true, that's saying that the system's momentum doesn't change. In other words, this system has a constant momentum. So that is momentum conservation. Okay, and recall this is for the case where there are um, no other 
external forces at play. Okay. So we only have these two internal forces. So another way of saying this is, if there's no external force on a system, then the system's momentum is constant, even though the individual momenta of the objects in that system could be changing. So how can something like this be used in practice? Well, a, a great practical application of this system momentum being conserved, even though the individual elements of the system have changing momentum, um, is the search for extrasolar planets, so planets around other stars. And that situation looks something like this, right? We have um, a star that hosts a planet, and the planet orbits, we like to say the planet orbits the star, but really um, the planet and the star are orbiting a center of mass of the system. We'll come back to that soon, the connection between momentum and center of mass. And so what that means is if there's no external force on this Earth, uh, sorry, in this planet star system, in other words, imagine this is isolated out in space. In that case, if the planet moves up at any given instant, the star must be moving down. Otherwise, the net momentum would be changing. If the star didn't move, but the planet's momentum was evolving as it orbited, then the system's momentum would also be changing. Okay, so for every change of the planet's direction, uh, momentum in one direction, the star's momentum has to change equally in the other direction. And if the planet is much less massive than the star, then the planet will have a much larger change in velocity than the star will, um, because the momentum depends both on the mass and the velocity. Okay, so as this planet orbits around the center of mass of the system, the stars will also make this small change in its motion, and you can detect that motion spectroscopically using telescopes on Earth, and you can look at frequency shifts of um, the, the radiation emitted by the star, and you can look for the wobbling motion of the host star as a way to detect that the, there is a planet or other body orbiting the star. Pretty cool. But next we want to kind of extend our discussion to say what happens if there are external forces on the system. And what we're going to find is that um, you're, we're going to end up using Newton's second law for each individual object in the system. We're going to discover that the whole system also behaves according to Newton's second law. And we can um, think of a system collectively as an object under study. Okay, so let's take this up, right? We have our two objects now and we're defining our system as the collection of both of those two objects. And um, let's consider the case where there are external forces and that each body experiences a different external force. So I need to draw those external forces. Uh, let's say object one is being pulled up and to the left. So we'll call that a force on one by some external source. And um, object two is also feeling some other separate external force force on two by some other external entity. So we have blue forces, which are internal to the system, and we have these two red forces, which are external to the system. Um, so our goal is to figure out how does the system's momentum change in response to these four forces? How does the system's momentum change in response to the forces? Well, we recall that the system's momentum is equal to the sum of object one's momentum and object two's momentum, and we can take a time derivative of this equation. I'll use the dot notation this time. And on the right hand side, we can replace P1 dot using Newton's second law, which tells us the rate of change of momentum one is given by the net external force, um, sorry, the net force on object one which is equal to the two forces that it feels, the force by one on, sorry, force on one by object two and this external force on object one. And we want to repeat the same thing for object two, which whose um, momentum will change in accordance to the net force on it. And there's two forces acting on object two, force on two by one and force on two by some external entity. Okay. So we can then use um, these two expressions in our um, expression for the system's momentum.
we can then find um, on the right hand side here f12 plus f1 external both of which are vectors those are the forces on object one and then the forces on object two like this and just as we showed last time the force by two on one is equal and opposite for the force by one on two so those will cancel and what are we left with well nothing but the external forces external force on object one and the external force on object two and that brings about a rate of change of the system's momentum but these two forces just represent the total force on the system. If we sum up all of the external forces on the system, we get the net external force on the system, and that is going to change the system's momentum. In other words, this is Newton's second law. For the system, rather than for a single particle in the system. So this is really beautiful. This, this says um, that the system can be treated as a single object and all of the forces acting on each individual component of your system can be treated or thought of as acting on the whole system collectively. Okay? And just to be um, explicit, what do we mean by net external force? Well, it means we're going to sum up all of the forces on all of the objects in our system. So if we have n objects in our system, we'll add all of the forces up from i equals 1 to i equals n, and that will tell us the net external force. Okay. So we see now we can, we can reframe um, Newton's second law for, or we have a Newton's second law for a system, and we can see if there's no net external force on the system, then the system's momentum cannot change. Okay. If there is a net external force on the system, then the system's momentum will change. So I'll call this the momentum principle. It's the principle by which, um, it's a principle that describes how we know when the system's momentum will change and how it will change. And so this is the momentum principle for a collection of particles. In other words, for a system. Great, so we've achieved our goal. We've gotten to this, this punchline, which is um, that, well, we've proved it for two objects, but you can extend these sums over two objects to sums over n objects, and you end up in the same place, that you can talk about a full system and the momentum of that full system and how the momentum of that full system changes in response to external forces. Another topic that we're going to get to um, later is how the center of mass serves as a proxy for the whole system. Okay? So we can actually assign to a point in space a location and talk about the momentum of that um, imaginary point, and we can talk about the change of the momentum of that imaginary point, and the relevant point, as we'll see, is the center of mass of the system. So until next time, when we talk about that topic, take care and be well.